Merkel Media. This was all circulating around the base that a giant had been killed, but no one was supposed to talk about it. I saw three long bony fingers reach up underneath the door, curl up to grab it, and then disappear. When he came over to me, dude, he slithered over to me. And this giant comes out of the cave, and they're all frozen. And he starts running and firing at this giant. But the giant moves. He's got a spear in one hand, and he's running really fast. And spears Dan and holds him up like this. Somebody yells, shoot him in the face, shoot him in the face. They basically decapitate him. Got closer, got closer, got closer. When he got about 15 yards away from me, I raised that 12 gauge and I blow his head off. I feel something pulling at my leg. And I look over and there are two small gray entities pulling at me. And they're literally, I'm getting pulled off the bed. I reached my hand into this bush and I touch air. Couldn't breathe and I couldn't move because I know I'm seeing a monster. All right. Take two. We have Ron Murphy on the show today, sir. What is going on? I, you know what, my friend, I'm so happy to be here. This has been planned for about like three and a half months and we're just finally getting to it now. And this is our, actually our second go because the first time we came on, there was a delay. So this is actually the second attempt at a show that was been planned for months. Yeah, it, it, it's nuts. And I'm glad uh, we're finally getting it done. Uh, I'm using Zoom. I haven't used Zoom in forever, but the service I normally use uh, is glitching. So uh, <laughs> went back to the default Zoom. So uh, listen, you and I got connected through uh, a, a common listener of my show, Laura. And she mentioned to me, she's like, you should have Ron on the show. And then I I, I think we were talking about the people at the um, the Dogman conference in Paris, Tennessee, and you were there and um, and I was there. So, you know, we just kind of, our paths kind of crossed over time. And, you know, I was like, let's get him on the show and talk. Uh, yeah, actually, I, you know, I, I've been a fan of yours and I saw you passing and I said hello, but you were very, very busy that day. So this is actually our first kind of official meeting. Yeah, I, I think this, it, it worked out great. Uh, let me ask you a quick question, uh, housekeeping real quick. Am I on video for you? Yeah. Okay, cool. Because I, I don't see me at all. So I just wanted to make yeah. sure you felt didn't feel like you were talking to a blank wall. Uh, no, actually, on, on my side, all you are is video. The, I don't even see myself on this. So if you can see me, gotcha. I can do all was good. All right. Sounds good. Uh, show self view. Got it. Right here it is. There it is. Uh, I don't know if I just jacked up my video recording, but I don't care. Uh, anyways, uh, I'm glad you're here. And uh, we're going to kind of launch off with the Chestnut Ridge topic, uh, and we'll see where it evolves from there. I, uh, coming from Pennsylvania, have heard of Chestnut Ridge since it's in Pennsylvania. I've never, I mean, we're talking, we're over 550 episodes into this, this show, and we've never done anything on Chestnut Ridge that I can remember. Maybe it's come up in conversation, um, but it was one of those things where, well, who do you talk to? You know, and because uh, I'm not the, like, the listeners know I'm not the guy that you know is going to inform you on on what Chestnut Ridge is or anything else. Like I talk to the people who know about the topics, uh, and so it was one of those things where I could have had Stan Gordon, I'm sure, uh, mm -hmm. but it, it just it's one of those things where it, it always works out for the best in the end, and you always just kind of like it's in the back of your head, but you never did anything with it. And here we are, and we're going to do something with it. Before we get into Chestnut Ridge, though. Uh, for the listeners, tell them who you are, what you're about, what you do. Tell them about your books and stuff like that. Excellent. So, okay, so um, I have grown up in the shadow of the Chestnut Ridge all of my life. So I, I, I was from a small town uh, in Western Pennsylvania called Blairsville that back at the time had two streetlights. And um, back in the day before podcasts, we used to have to go to the radio, right? Uh, it's hard to believe that people were doing that, you know, even, you know, 40 some years ago. But um, you mentioned Stan Gordon. Without Stan Gordon, I would not be here because about twice a month, he would be on KDK, which is a uh, radio station in Pittsburgh. 
And he would talk about all the kind of strange goings on that was happening uh, back in the 70s. Now, as a kid, this was a great time to be alive um, because, you know, we had In Search Of, we had That's Incredible. So all these great programs were on. But in my town, it was boring. Nothing was going on until Bigfoot was being cited. And that was awesome, you know. So my mother and I, we would listen to um, Stan Gordon talking on the radio. And then the next day, we would go to the sites that he had mentioned that was right outside of our town. And we would go investigate for ourselves. Now, of course, we never found anything. But like I said, this was a great time to be alive. And um, I would go to, uh, the kids nowadays can just Google things. But uh, back in the day, we had to go to libraries, right? And it was kind of like a, an investigation in and of itself because you had to go to a hard catalog. You had to do all this kind of stuff. You know, you had to find the footprints to lead you in the right direction. And my town's library had a couple Bigfoot books. But it was great because as a kid, I was sitting there, I was absorbing this stuff, and I was really just excited about all this kind of stuff. And um, it stayed with me until high school, and then I found out that high school girls really don't find guys <laughs> but that interesting. I, I know it's changed now, my friend, but uh, back in the day, it didn't. But um, I, then I went to college. I went to the University of Pittsburgh, and I was studying anthropology. And I remember this, you know, like it was yesterday, even though it was, you know, like 30 years ago. But I was sitting down at my desk. It was an anthropology 101 class, you know, introduction to anthropology. And there was a, a, a chapter in there about um, this idea that a species of a gigantopithecus may have existed into the historical era. And this gave us the idea, at least the notion of the abominable snowman. And this was from a book that was not published by Amazon. This was a book that was actually, you know, these were by professors that had written this book. And they had the idea that there might be a remnant population of Gigantopithecus that was the basis for, you know, our, our, our myths. And I thought, this is, this is awesome. And it was like Bigfoot now entered the room, sat down beside me and said, now what do you do with me? Right. So as an academic and also as somewhat a lover of the paranormal, I thought, let's see how we can look at the supernatural and through the cryptozoology from a multidisciplinary perspective. So I used psychology and sociology and mythology and kind of blended all together to get to the archetype of what we're looking at. Because once we get to the archetype, we can now trace some sort of history. And for a lover of Bigfoot and werewolves and vampires and all that kind of stuff, and as somebody that writes about all these things, I try to find the genesis for these things within the historical record, which sometimes is very difficult and very nebulous. But I try to go back as far as I can to find out where these things got their origin story and then why in the 21st century do we need these creatures now? So as someone that writes about these things, I've written about mermaids and I've written about, you know, Bigfoot and Dogman and ghosts and fairies and witches and all this other kind of stuff. But um, the one book that I'm quite proud of and the first book that I've ever written about the paranormal was The Unexplained World of the Chestnut Ridge, which was 30 years of my investigation into this area that I still call home. Uh, oddly enough, I live at the corner right now of Chestnut and Ridge, and the Chestnut Ridge is right outside my window right now. And it was from there, it's from this very odd area that is not a very big piece of property, right? It only extends from, you know, about 75 miles and it terminates in Morgantown, West Virginia. So, but in this very narrow corridor, we have Bigfoot sightings and UFO encounters and, and just strange things that go on. So much so that back in the 1970s, this was called the Twilight Zone of Pennsylvania. And you would think that there might have been some sort of fervor going on of, you know, a Bigfoot sighting. So people have this kind of mass hysteria about things that go bump in the night. But even now, you know, there are reports coming out of there weekly, if not daily at certain times of the year. Wow. So uh, you write this book and it kind of carries throughout time, really. I mean, it starts what, back when you were a kid about the Chestnut yeah. Ridge. And it's still having weird, crazy things happen now. Um, uh, first of all, I want to uh, just before we get away from it, uh, where where can people get your books on Amazon? Right? Yeah, you can get them on Amazon. Actually, uh, uh, about a year ago, 
Uh, Walmart picked up several of my books as well, too. So I was very happy about that. So if you can't find them on Amazon, you can go to Walmart. And if Walmart does not carry them there, at least you can order them and they'll be there overnight or what have you. Wow. But yeah, you can get me on Amazon or you can contact me you know, through Facebook, social media or whatever, uh, Ronald Murphy, and, uh, and I'd be happy to get you out of anything that you need. Um, because at the end of the day, whenever I go to conferences, I'm in awe of people that I'm there with. Like, I can't believe that I'm there. So I buy their books because I think that anytime we have literature out about a particular subject, you need so many different points of views to in, in order to get a real good focus on what's going on. So that's that's what I do, my friend. I I, I see myself here with all these people like Ken Gearhart and you know Loud Blackburn and things. What the heck am I doing here? But I think that we all need to have these different perspectives in order to see a clearer focus of what we're looking at. Yeah, I I had a similar experience with Lyle. Uh, I, one of these days, I'm sure he'll be in the studio to chop it up. But I remember it was at the the uh, Paris conference. Uh, I was walking by him and I just shake his hand and he looks at me right in the eyes. He's like, man, you're blowing up. And I'm just like, you know who I am? Like, <laughs> it's like, what? Uh, uh, no, that's absolutely the case. You get that kind of fuzzy feeling in there because these people who were, you know, your idols, especially whenever you're starting out, you know, you see these people and you think these are the best of the best. And uh, then they finally know who you are. And that's, that's a great feeling. It was wild. So, uh, and, and you know, um, Let's let's bring it into the Chestnut Ridge conversation here. Uh, you you brought up kind of like how you got involved in the the whole thirty years is a long time for looking into the topic. Uh, what was the first that you at least can recall uh, the first experience that happened at Chestnut Ridge that kind of launched it off into this weird because or was it something that was like always historically there and we just didn't really document until a certain time period. No, no, it, I think it was always been there. Um, so whenever I, so I went to the University of Pittsburgh and, um, I have my BA in literature and then I have my master's degree in history. Okay. So from, from Indiana University of Pennsylvania. So I like to look at everything from a historical perspective. So if this stuff was going on now, uh, history doesn't exist in a vacuum. So obviously there was something going on there before. Uh, sorry about that. I have a, a bird as well, too, that's being very vocal right now. So, fine. But, so um, I start finding out these these writings, you know, pre um, uh, Revolutionary War, calling this area the Howling Wilderness. Now, of course, there's different ways to look into that, but you know, talking about Bigfoot howling and things like that, it's very strange they were using the same type of terminology. But there was always this kind of oddity to this area because you would find out reports of of lumbermen that came to this area and were leaving certain areas alone because there was unusual feelings there. Um, it's really, like like I said, it's really interesting to see that it's just not happening now. There's a continuation of something going on. And it was in this area that the first Bigfoot report was back in the 1840s, I believe it was, so before the Civil War. And this was the area where, you know, UFOs and strange lights in the sky have been reported. And the idea of the Tommyknockers, which miners had talked about, and ghosts and everything. So we're going back to a tradition that goes back at least several hundred years, at least two or 300 years. And in American time, that's like, you know, eternity. But we're talking about going back to the trappers, you know, in the late 1600s, that there was something unusual going on here. What was the uh, first experience with Bigfoot? I mean, that that's, I didn't know that. I didn't know that the first encounter with Bigfoot was, was in Pennsylvania, let alone Chestnut yeah. Ridge. Yeah. Well, this is what's odd about this encounter too. And I bring this up to people. So to, to put it in perspective, there was Major League Baseball being played in certain parts of the country at this time. But there was a trapper that was in Indiana County that claimed to have seen what he called a wild man because these were all wild men. Before the name Bigfoot came to us or the name of Sasquatch that was brought up from the Pacific Northwest, these were wild men. And it was just a, simply a trapper that wandered into town uh, that claimed that he had seen a wild man. And all these towns now that we have connected by highways, you know, these sometimes were days apart from each other. You know, at one time, this area that we're talking about, and we're talking about into the, uh, into the early 1800s, the, 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 uh, there was a doctor who was about a week away from where we're at. So, you know, when you think about Pennsylvania now with all the Walmarts and universities and everything like that, it wasn't that way until very, very recently. So the idea that there was a wild man prowling about, you know, outside in the outskirts and, you know, the, 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 the borderland of the wilderness was really a story in and of itself. 
Um, and then there was unfortunate things that happened to the Chestnut Ridge um, at, at the turn of the uh, 19th century into the 20th century. Uh, there was a chestnut blight that killed off all these trees. And the chestnut tree at one time stood, you know, 100 foot tall, 10 feet around, bigger in, in, in other parts of the country down towards Georgia, but they rained from Georgia to Maine. So this was a big blow to the Chestnut Ridge because, you know, that was the name of it. Now that the tree is gone and then lumbering came in. So again, you know, you have this place that was barren, you know, for, for, for many, many uh, years, but now everything is reclaimed. Uh, the, the, the trees are back. It's still a wilderness. Um, but I try to tell people, you know, they say that, you know, Bigfoot can't live in an area like this. But I will tell you, at one time, and this was all man's doing, of course, this was the home to elk. This was the ho a home to, you know, mountain lions. And at one time, up until the time of the, the French and Indian War, uh, the Chestnut Ridge was also home to the woodland bison, which was larger than the plains bison that we have nowadays. So to say that it cannot hold very large animals is a complete and utter uh, fallacy, because at one time it did. Um, and so as a theorist and somebody that investigates this, I look and see, is it possible, you know, even though this place was warded at one time and even though this place was pretty much domesticated at one time, is it possible that these populations that once exist there are now moving back in and reclaiming? And I think that that's what's going on. Now, people like Stan Gordon thinks that there's always been a population of Bigfoot within the Chestnut Ridge. But I don't see that as something that is plausible. Um, I think the Chestnut Ridge works as a great highway for for these kind of animals. It's easy to get from one place to another without being seen because people live along the Chestnut Ridge. But the the the, the top of the ridge itself is pretty you know pretty sparse. There's not anything that goes up there, so it's a perfect highway to remain elusive and get around. So my theory is if these creatures are indeed flesh and blood animals, they have to necessarily be migratory because if they stay in one place for too long, uh, they're not only going to diminish all the all the the the, the um, resources in that particular area, but the, the chances of being uncovered will be uh, uh, quite likely as well too. So I see the Chestnut Ridge as a great thoroughfare for these things that go bump in the night to travel without being seen by us. So it's like a spooky highway, you know, it just... A spooky super highway. I like that term. Yes, sir. Yeah, that's that's wild. So, uh, with with the the migratory idea of things, is there is that? So you mentioned kind of like other creatures, but do you hear of other creatures other than Bigfoot involved with Chestnut Ridge? I mean, I know like um, it's not that far from Point Pleasant with Mothman. I don't know if there's ever been Mothman sightings, but it was, like I know when I first started all this stuff that I do now, uh, dog, the topic of dog man was starting to pick up steam. And I remember, and I don't, I don't remember exactly where Chestnut Ridge is. It like in my mind, looking at the state of Pennsylvania, but, uh, I know Southeastern Pennsylvania was started getting a lot of dog man chatter. Like people seeing things has, has that been popping up on Chestnut Ridge. It has, it has. So, this is awesome. I'm glad you brought this up because connecting the dots and everything like that. Uh, Point Pleasant sits on the Appalachian Plateau, the same way we are at as well, too. So there is this geological connection between all these kind of things. And a lot of people say geology does come into play, right? We can talk about that later. But, you know, for all intents and purposes, we are geologically the same type of structure that we have here. And that might be what's producing these things. You know, these might be earth energies, but absolutely. So I was a teacher for most of my adult life and somebody, I was in the teacher uh, 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 break room and um, somebody else came in and know that I like Bigfoot and everything. And she said, I saw something strange the other day and I don't, don't understand what was going on. You might have a, have any kind of inkling. I said, so what happened? So here in Western Pennsylvania, people like to go around spotting deer. I don't know if you have that phenomenon yeah. in tennis, but, but that's where, you know, right before the hunting season, people go out with these big spotlights and shine them in the field, looking for deer in hopes of possibly harvesting one of those in the upcoming season. So she said, as she was doing this, she had actually the spotlight landed on what she thought was a wolf in the in the field she said you could see this huge wolf head this huge canine head but what set it apart from everything else it is appeared as if its knees were drawn up to it and it had its arms around its knees if it was kind of like cradling itself just sitting in the field watching 
I had never heard about this before. And she said, the only thing I can think that it was, was a werewolf. Now that's the word that she used. Now, again, connecting the dots, this sighting was off of a place called Meteor Road in Kecksburg, Pennsylvania, where the Kecksburg incident happened back in the early 1960s. So we see all these kind of strange things happening here. But that was the first time I ever heard about this werewolf. Now, I was up in the Chestnut Ridge with a gentleman named Sam Sherry, who had a Bigfoot sighting back in 1984. And he claimed, um, hold on one second again, I got a, she, she's usually not like this, but this is giving me a little bit. Okay, there, there she goes. All right, so um, this, back in 1984, he claims to have had a sighting along the Wuhanna River. Um, but his sighting was a little bit strange because he was fishing at night, and he heard something, and he looked across the bank, and there was some creature over there. He turned around to get in his car, and uh, in a second like that, the creature had crossed the river and appeared now behind his car. The word he used was materialized. And um, he said the creature actually like waved at him as he pulled away. He said he described the face as looking very um, uh, Native American. And the skin was more leathery and really didn't have any kind of hair on it. But from that time on, people thought that it was a Bigfoot. And in order so he didn't think that people were calling him crazy all the time, he was going to go out and try to prove the existence of these creatures. So he had all these kind of. Uh, Rube Goldberg type of experiment set up, like putting an apple around aluminum foil or around aluminum foil around barbed wire. So the creature would reach in there and would some hair would get caught or whatever. So he wanted to prove the existence of these creatures. So we were up on the chestnut ridge and he goes, I've seen two types of Bigfoot up here. I said, really? And that was the first time I ever heard of any of this stuff going on. And he said, the one type was the large lumbering type of gentle giant that you would get the Harry and the Henderson type of fame, right? And he said the other kind was a much thinner type of Bigfoot. I've never heard this before. And it had an elongated snout and it hunted in packs. And I had never heard this before. And then Dogman now finally comes out into, in, into the into the foray, right? So at this point now, I thought, well, I've been listening to these stories now before it was even given a name. And now Dogman comes up, which I think is kind of a disservice to this animal as well, too, because I think that they've always been out there, especially in places like Michigan. You know, I wrote my On Dog Man book several years ago, and I found out, you know, from the 1800s, they were seeing things out there that appeared to be, you know, for lack of a better term, a dog man or, or a werewolf or what have you. But um, these things have been around for a while and sometimes are given rather silly names. Like even Mothman is a rather silly name. It's hard to take things like that seriously. Uh, but getting back to your point, yes, I think that these things have always been around, but now we just have names. We have names now. So they're become part of our vernacular that way. Yeah, it, it's it's cultural names. Uh, you know, okay. people like I mean, at one time Dogman was probably called Anubis, you know. That's and right. and so Absolutely. yes, that's right. That's right. So it, I, I to get back on that because again, somebody tuning in or somebody has a passing interest in this, you know, they can say, you know, these guys are fruitcakes, you know, they're, they're what are they talking about? This I already know up. I am, sucker. I exactly. already know I am. <laughs> yes. But but when we talk about things like Anubis, we can talk about entire civilizations built upon a notion that a human being can transform into another, you know, an, an, another manifestation. Now we have to take that into account, my friend, you know, the, the idea of Anubis, you know, this dog headed God, you know, sometimes he is represented as a human human form as well, too. They're, they're much more rare, but the idea of a transformative of God has always been there and we really need to kind of take that into consideration and say, hey, this seems to be part of our, you know, this is wired into our DNA. Is it wired into our DNA because in our ancient past, we as a collective humanity had encountered these creatures? That's very Jungian. You know, this is, this is the stuff of Carl Jung, the idea of a collective unconscious. But that is the gist of my research. I firmly believe that in our distant past, we had encountered these creatures. They became part of our mythology. And now the question is, is it possible these creatures are still out there? Uh, the answer is yes. <laughs> I, I feel right. that way. Uh, but yeah, I, uh, off the Anubis idea, I just saw, I think it might have been on Instagram. You know how uh, certain things kick. So when something's on Joe Rogan and it hits hard, mm -hmm. it tends to just spark a bunch of stuff you see on the internet right. then. And uh, we had, uh, um, um, now I'm drawing a blank, uh, Carl... Um, uh, Randall Carlson. We had, Randall Carlson was on Rogan's show, 
And uh, he started talking about ancient technology and how the Egyptians might have moved into Egypt and the stuff was already there, the the pyramids. And uh, I believe he said, yeah, because he said that, that uh, I think it was him, somebody said about how the Sphinx and how the head is like a pharaoh head and stuff, the, the, the Sphinx was probably already there and they replaced the head with a pharaoh head. And then I saw on Instagram, somebody overlaid a dog that would be laying down and it looks very proportionate. And uh, it's like, maybe there was a giant Anubis statue already existing there. And the Egyptians came in and they're like, I think we're going to replace the dog head with our God, Pharaoh, whatever, you know, makes sense to me. Right. It it does. Because if you look at it, um, the head doesn't seem proportionate to the Sphinx as it appears now. Right. And I like that idea of these kind of resets, right? These kind of um, uh, resets within humanity. And we'll take this. I know this is going off the track a little bit, but I think it's something to talk about too. So archaeologists and and anthropologists, I I don't think they like to talk about this, but there is one point in our history that definitely is a reset that people will sometimes talk about, but a lot of people aren't knowledgeable about. And this was a period called the Younger Dryas. And the reason why they call that, it's a little alpine flower that's still in existence now. But at one time, it was prevalent around the world during glaciation. So what happens to the Younger Dryas? So we're talking about a time after all these great ice sheets had already come back, right? So this was a time whenever there was some some superficial farming going on, some animal husbandry going around the world. Probably pigs were being raised at this time, probably chickens. And there was the signs that humanity was finally getting together and coalescing in civilizations. We have places in in Russia, in the Caucasus Mountains, where you even have megalithic structures going on up at this time. So this was a time right around, you know, 13,000 to to 12,000 years ago. But what happens is as we all, as, as humanity is getting together, we're starting to form communities. We're starting to not be so much hunter-gatherers anymore. There is a sudden cold spell, and that's the Younger Dryas period. And it lasts for about a 1,000 years. Now, unlike the Ice Age that took you know thousands of years to happen, this happened in a matter of decades. And we're talking about the temperature dropping to the point that hunter-gatherer lifestyle was now necessary again. So imagine you know, you're a 10-year-old child you are brought up in a place where everybody's getting together. There's enough food to eat. You know, if you want to eat something, you just go to your backyard. And this kind of stuff was going on. Now the time you're 20, you know, now the snow's back around again. And you have stories. You have stories about the way it used to be that you tell your children. And by the time you pass away and your children pass away, it's becoming like the game of telephone at this point because we remember at a time whenever we had enough food to eat. You know, it was almost like, you know, a paradise sort of thing if you think about it. You know, we didn't have to be afraid of the wild animals because we, we live in these structures and everything. Now, imagine, if you will, you know, this is this is the time the Younger Dryas period only lasted for a very short duration. Now, imagine you were part of a hunter-gatherer clan and you come across an abandoned village that was built, you know, several hundred years ago you would think the giants would have built it because these are great stone structures. You would think something from another planet would have built it. This is part of our mythology, right? That somehow there was this reset, you know, this, and in this case, it was, you know, a, a climactic reset uh, that we were uh, usurped by nature and our dominance was now replaced by us going, becoming hunter gatherers again and wondering about the world, you know, with spears in our hand. Um, after we were already starting rudimentary, you know, planting and everything. So these things do happen. And I think that from an archaeological point of view and an anthropological point of view, we need to keep this in mind. If we know this particular period happened, what's to say that our reset didn't happen thousands of years before that, right? I mean, it's very possible. And so I keep an open mind. And I think, I like to think that, you know, according to, mainstream archaeology that we as human beings have been around here for a hundred thousand years, but we're only to believe that when the last, you know, 25,000 years, we start making an imprint on our society by, you know, painting on rocks and things like that. And then, you know, all of a sudden, 5,000 years ago, we start with pyramids. We start with Stonehenge. We start with all this other kind of stuff. 
Or is it, in fact, that we are just rediscovering these kind of things, that we had this huge flourishing civilization 200,000, you know, 100,000 years ago, then all of a sudden we lost it for whatever reasons. So now we look at these things and marvel because we forgot about the technology that we had in order to make this kind of stuff happen, you know. Um, from uh, 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 a religious point of view, and I know we have to bring this in because that does kind of uh, shed light on who we are as well, too. I remember taking this one class, and it was part of the uh, the uh, medieval imagination that the farther we get away from the time of creation, the more and more we digress. We go back to our animalistic ways. So there's something to be said there because even the Greeks did this. You know, if we're looking at a you know non-Judeo-Christian background as well, too. Even the Greeks thought that there was these different ages of men, right? We had this golden age, you know, the time of heroes, the time of great art, the time of culture. And now we keep on going back and forth. And now we ended up in the Stone Age. So we, as people now look at the Stone Age, was at the very beginning. And now we are to where we are right now. But wouldn't that be something that the Stone Age was just a transition in our great, um, you know, our great march to whatever, which wherever we're going to? That that'd be amazing. Uh, I, yeah. I I the more the older I'm getting, the more I'm fascinated by looking into those topics and just and maybe it's because you know when you're a kid you don't have much history. You know mm -hmm. that's why everything seems to take forever. When you're five years old and you say, uh, "Well, it's Christmas Day and you're not going to have Christmas again for another year," you're like, "That's forever because you only <laughs> lived five of those." You know, right. but when that's you're right. my age, almost forty, it's like, "Well, that's going to come real fast." You know, <laughs> and right. so the perspective. Right. And so the older I get, the more I, I just get more interested in the history of where we come from. And I've always kind of been interested in history, but uh, it, I guess maybe the weirder I get, the more my my interests shift in my historical interests. Uh, right. But um, maybe let's let's make a hard shift back to Chestnut Ridge, uh, and it, maybe maybe we're living in a historical shift within these kind of um, areas. Uh, yes. We we know that you know you you can look at the history of these areas and see you know the stories coming out of them, and uh, I look at the Chestnut Ridge area, southeastern Pennsylvania. Uh, you mentioned about the Kecksburg UFO uh, and how there's been I think you mentioned about dogman sightings in that area. Mm -hmm. um, do you view and this is gonna this, listen? I, we talked about it before we started. It's going to go a little woo woo here, so I, it, just feel free to say I don't believe that. But you know, I'm going to go there. Um, do you look at the Chestnut Ridge area kind of like maybe the Bridgewater Triangle area, where like it's like it seems like there's geographical locations where there's all this activity happening from different, seemingly different topics like UFOs to Dogman to Bigfoot to Mothman, whatever. Uh, do you think that, like, say, the Bridgewater Triangle to Chestnut Ridge, um, I the way I view it is there's some kind of almost like a thinning of a veil where the weird can peek through a lot easier. Mm -hmm. uh, how do you view these geographic? Because you mentioned about how you might revisit the idea of how ge geology plays into all this. Um, how do you how do you view that stuff? Because it does seem like yeah. there's a pattern of very specific areas that have a lot of weird stuff. Happen. That's right. That's right. Well, I'm glad you brought up about the Bridgewater Triangle because a couple of weeks ago, I actually got to investigate several places in the Bridgewater Triangle. And um, what's odd is, you know, you'll drive into the Bridgewater Triangle area and in the woods, you'll find ancient burial ground from the settlers there that dated the 1640s, right? And then there was Indian burial grounds dating back to the Wampanoag, you know, well before the white man came. So this was a place of burial, and this was a place where it was excluded from like the normal world of the living. Right? It was always a sacred place. Like the you know the Wampanoag name for uh, uh, for the Huckabuck Swamp is the place where spirits dwell or spirits walk. So it seems as even in the native tongue that this was not a place for the living. This was a place set apart from. But as people expand into the area, you know they they become less superstitious and everything. But yes, I think that that's what's going on. And I think that these great triangles that we have has always been set aside for the very, from the very beginning. And it's only now that we start, you know, 
like I said, thrusting off these ideas of superstition. And whenever that happens, and people move into this these areas, these are the things that we encounter, right? And the idea of the veil between two worlds, I think that's very, very adequate. Um, are these places where portals exist? You know, are these places that are naturally occurring uh, places where earth energy is there to allow these kind of doors to open in other worlds. And I think that that is truly the possibility of what we're talking about here. Not only the possibility, but maybe even the plausibility why so many things are being seen, but nothing's being captured. It seems as if something can enter into these worlds, these triangles, um, be flesh and blood there for, for whatever amount of time and then return to their own world. So we can get evidence, but we don't have the, the physicality that we need. Um, and uh, the idea of ghosts as well, too. And the other thing that we didn't talk about either is the idea of fairies as well. We in America don't like to talk about fairies because they seem, you know, we have this Victorian imagination. But whenever you look at it from the, the original point of view, the way it would have been, you know, in the, 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 the Middle Ages, you know, fairies, these kind of elementals that are spirits within the landscape itself, I think it makes tremendous sense when we talk about these things as well, too. Maybe we are dealing with earth energies itself that is not, you're not seeing Bigfoot, you're not seeing Dogman, but you're being acted upon by some force that's making you think that you're seeing these creatures. And that's the reason we don't have any photographs. You just... Uh... You hit the button for me. I love <laughs> when you're like, it might be portals. I'm like, yes. <laughs> no. Well, it, it, so, so whenever I, I say these kind of things, like, you know, it's, oh, that's a guy's opinion. That doesn't make any sense. So I try to find some sort of empirical evidence that would suggest that other people thought this way. And Rene Descartes, you know, who wrote the Cartesian theories and stuff like that, he had the idea that, yes, indeed, the mind can play that way that we are kind of a blank slate in there. And it's possible that we are kind of like the directors of our own films. So, and then of course, this is going back before there was films, but I mean, I'm using these analogies. But the idea that we have within us, um, our reality exists right in our brain. And if there are energies out there that can somehow impress themselves within that energy of our brain, you know, we talk about things like infrasound. Is it possible that this kind of infrasounds that are being used to play within us some sort of image or some sort of, um, you know, some sort of paradigm that will keep us out of a particular area or whatever. So these are the things that I'm working on right now. The idea that our mind can be affected by these beings, these elementals, whatever, and allow us to see things because that's a great way to be, um, elusive that's a great way to be territorial without being uh a confrontation you know that's a way as well too and we know a little bit about infrasound because it has a military aspect and we know if we play certain types of frequencies we get feelings of what has been called you know paranormal thoughts you know hearing voices or seeing images you know something like that so it's very possible that what we call the paranormal experience the supernatural experiences actually being worked on intentionally towards us by these forces within the natural world and maybe these forces wow. exist within these triangles and these triangles then indeed are the portals that we're talking about uh what you're describing is awesome because i have recently been talking about this when i can and i don't know how to put my thoughts together on it and i've just been calling it very simply a mind portal mm -hmm. and uh and I, and I really, like, I was thinking about this, I would say, the time of this recording is uh, uh, July 3rd, 2023. And I would say in the fall of 2022, I started thinking about this stuff. And I really started talking about the mind portal in January of 2023, when I released an episode, it was 510, and I called it uh, Interdimensional Dog Man or something like that. Uh, and... It's a story of a guy, his name Hunter, and the people listening are familiar with this, so I'll, I'll just go quickly on it. But um, he's here in Tennessee with me, about three hours from me, and he has this terrible nightmare that he perceived as a nightmare. And he wakes up, he's sitting up in his bed, sweating. He notices that he has handprints and scratches on his back. And logically, you could say, well, you had a nightmare, you did it yourself, dude. 
uh, stop be- stop hitting yourself. Stop hitting, hitting yourself, you know? Um, and he tells his wife about it and he carries on. A few days later, he is walking out in the woods with his son, who's 11 years old at the time. And I, I should probably rewind and tell the story real quick. Um, the dream was he was in his dream out in the woods with his family and there was a dog man standing there and looked at him, looked at his family and started going at his family. And he runs, gets between the dog man and his family and the thing starts tearing him to pieces. And he wakes up in his bed and he has these bruises all over him. So he's out in the woods with his son a few days later and he and his son both see an upright standing dog uh, staring at him. And he's like, it was the exact same dog that was in my dream. And they they run out of there. This thing, I believe I remember correctly, pursues them, but it doesn't get them. And I told, and that's another thing that is so woo-woo weird about this is because if it's a natural creature and it's chasing you, it's going to get you just like a cougar, a bear, a, a bobcat is going to mm-hmm. catch you. And if there's an but- upright walking dog that's chasing after you, that's eight feet tall, it's going to get you if it wants to get you, but it didn't. And there's something weird about that. It, it, it almost like there's ro- rules and laws that are at play that they can't do certain things. Um, but I started calling it the mind portal. Like there's something about our mind that allows these things to manifest. And it's not the only time I've heard this. And, and, and there's also like this, this bridge that I talk about too. And I don't know how to explain it, but I think there's, there's, I don't think there's just one other realm or reality, but uh, let's just keep it to two, ours and another one. I, I, I'm, I'm, there's, there's a bridge and these mm-hmm. things cross over on the bridge and sometimes we cross over on the bridge and sometimes maybe it's the dream state or something like it where we're on the bridge. We're not in this world. We're not in another world. We're somewhere on the, in the middle, on this bridge, we're between realities. And these things meet us there. And if we leave to come back to this realm and we don't close that door fast enough or somehow do these things come through? It, it, it's just something that, and I don't, listen, you're the researcher. You, you clearly have done research on things and you're an academic. I'm a former truck driver with a podcaster. So I, I have limited vocabulary, but this is well, how I feel inside, man. <laughs> yeah. Well, I think that was the most eloquently I've ever heard of. And I've never heard of anything called a mind portal. And I think that makes, that's a beautiful sense. And that sums up absolutely everything that we have just been talking about. Because a lot of people don't understand that, you know, as I talked about before, the reality really is subjective. My reality is different than your reality. You know, people that go ghost hunting, you know, sometimes they see something, sometimes other people don't see the thing. As I've been researching more and more, I've come to this conclusion. I've come to the conclusion that almost any time there is an encounter or there is, you know, some sort of experience, it almost is as if it has to ask you permission, if that makes any sense. There's almost as if there is a circuit that's required that you have to flip a switch in order to this come into a manifestation, right? That's something that you and I have to work on there, Tony. This is something we have to figure out Mm -hmm. what's going on. Because if that is indeed the case, then the idea of shamanism, you know, that's another thing that I, I'm very interested in. The idea that the shaman was just a normal, normal everyday person that could cross that bridge. See, these beautiful terms that you came up to, that he was able to, within his mind, enter another state of being. And through that becomes a conduit to the other world where there are answers that we do not have in this world. And that's beautifully said because that is where we meet the other. That is the liminal space of our humanity. That is going to places where the animal exists or the primal or the fury or the natural. If we are indeed the reason by going into that bridge, that mind portal, now we are experiencing the chaos. And what do we do with that? See, that, these are all great things. And it actually kind of gives me goosebumps because I love talking to you about this. And we could probably go on for hours and hours. But uh, as far as a researcher right now, that is really where I'm kind of, you know, putting all my cards right now. This is where I'm coming from. And I know that, that will probably ostracize me from a lot of people. But this is the only thing that makes not only academic sense, 
that sense to me as somebody that has experienced things myself. The only way I can describe it to you, it was a very personal type of thing that had happened to me. And there's no other way that I can explain it to you or explain it to me. And whenever I'm at conferences and people come up to me, the things that they tell me is an experience that was essential and unique to them. It happened to them. And there's as if it's a verb, as if there's an action upon them. And that is, you know, that, that that's five other shows in and of themselves. I'm sure. Uh, well, wh- what what experience are you referencing? What, what did you go through? Okay, so this, this is a very, two experiences that I had that I can share with involving light anomalies, okay? So the first time I was on an investigation with one other researcher, and we were going to an area where there was uh, purported um, werewolf activity, dogman activity. So we were walking, and it was probably around midnight, and all of a sudden, the air around us starts looking like um, static electricity, like whenever you pull a blanket off of a bed. There's all this static electricity going on. And the way we were in, we were on a, an old abandoned bridge, an old railway bridge. And we were out in the middle of the bridge, and we were starting to get freaked out about this. So we wanted to get back to our car, which was about a mile away. But the only way to get back to our car is by you know turning and going off the bridge and going the one way in and the one way out. It was the same way. So as we turn back to go back, a light illuminates um, for a split second. It looks almost like a flare going on, and it just kind of dances into existence and then then flares out again. And we thought, what the, you know, what's going on here? I've never seen anything like this before. But we knew we had to go that way in order to get out. So as we go that way, where we hit the area where we saw the, the, the light anomaly, now something is off in the woods beside us as if whatever that light was allowed this thing to now become manifest in our world. We didn't see anything, mind you. We didn't see anything. But we heard something following us in the woods. Now, the the really scary thing, and of course, we went down there with the preconceived notion that we were looking for Bigfoot. But the thing was, though, whenever we kind of compared our, our experience, Within our mind's eye, we saw the same thing, these yellow eyes, you know, nothing, not a full body form, but this is what our our minds or maybe even our instincts was telling us. We saw these yellow eyes. We saw snot. We saw teeth. We knew that was ever in those woods that was following us was a predator, right? And we were its prey. And um, as we found the road to get back to our car, Whatever this was, again, you talked about not approaching us. We never saw it, but it stayed in the woods and you could hear it snarling, right? You could tell that it was upset with us finding our way back because through some sort of unspoken agreement, it could not enter into the area where we were at, right? If that makes any sense, which it doesn't, but that's the thing that made sense to me. I've always been fascinated by these light anomalies, these these kind of, you know, if this was a few hundred years ago, we would call them spook lights. And back in, you know, back in the Middle Ages, they would be called fairy lights. But these lights that seem to emanate out of nowhere and have an intelligence to them. Um, I was doing a series with Seth Breedlove for Small Town Monsters called uh, uh, Sasquatch Uncovered the Ridge, which was focusing on the Chestnut Ridge. This was the first season. And this is one of those rare things when an investigation was filmed and these things show up. Uh, so it was the very second episode of that series. You can find them on YouTube for free. Um, we were out in the woods looking for Bigfoot. We hear a couple strange things, maybe a howl, maybe, you know, a wood knock, maybe, you know, nothing definitive. But then we start hearing a sound that sounds like um, uh, wind chimes. And now we're talking about the idea of frequency coming into play, right? Something going on here, some sort of frequency coming into play. So we see these three lights moving in the woods, and we just assume that they were, you know, cell phones or something like that illuminated. These three lights are moving through the woods, and all of a sudden they start going up into the air, up into the trees. So there's something very, very strange going on. There were two cameras rolling. Everybody got to see these things. And was this that these lights were playing cat and mouse with us? Um, at the end of the day, if we were doing a ghost investigation, we would have seen orbs. A UFO investigation, this would have been UFOs. You know, all these kind of things come into existence when we're looking for Bigfoot. If this was around a religious area, this could have been a religious experience, right? So it seems as if the whole paranormal is tied up in this kind of gray area. And every now and then, 
if the conditions are right or if they allow themselves to be manifested, we could enter into their world or they enter into our world. But those are the two things that really have kind of set me along this, this idea as well, too. The idea of this light, which is a frequency in and of itself, and the sound that we heard producing a frequency as well, too. These might be the keys that open up these doorways into another realm. And uh, again, I still get goosebumps thinking about this all the time. But uh, it's not the first time, not the second time. I've, I've experienced these lights many, many times. That's that's really interesting. Uh, I So the, people will ask me, because I, I think orbs are just so common uh, mm. that people, that's one of the number one things I get asked about is what do you think orb, orbs are? I'm like, I, I don't know. I don't know what to tell you. I think it's a light that you saw. Like I don't outside of that. I don't know what to tell you because there's right. so much to it. And what you're presenting here has my mind turning. And it's a it's a unique direction that I would like to just put out right now before I forget. Anybody that's listening right now that might have had some kind of light orb experience followed immediately, not a day or so. I'm talking about that night, that day, immediately followed by physical activity, whether it's uh, a, a sighting of a creature or hearing something paralleling you, please uh, reach out to us because th this is a line of thinking that um, I I'm very interested in because what if, like, like, let's just say, let's just lay the groundwork here for, for, for to start. Orbs can be anything. We don't, we don't know what they are. Let, let, but we're going to go a specific direction here on this this conversation. Um, what if orbs are the vehicle between realms? And mm. I mean, we're talking about something interdimensional. So it, throw fit law of law of physics and physical dimensions out the window. If you see an orb that's the size of a softball, and then you have a dogman encounter, it doesn't mean the dogman couldn't have come from the orb. Because we're talking about parallel universes, we're talking about it, it transcending dimensions, and we don't know what that vehicle looks like to do so. Uh, mm. But what if we do? It, and let's go into some Bigfoot talk with this too, because um, my buddy Wes at Sasquatch Chronicles, uh, when they had their Bigfoot encounter, they went out to the same exact area. And I was just out there two, three months ago shooting a film uh, on the scene. So I know exactly where his encounter happened, and I know exactly where these lights happened, and they are very close. I'm talking less than a quarter mile. They they go out to do their investigation stuff, you know, because he's at, when he had this experience, he was enamored by it. Um, they go out there, and they're on a bridge, and there's this light floating above the water, and he has it on video, and it will be in the film. Uh, and then they yell out to it, hey, and they eventually see this light go up a hill. And I've seen the hill in daylight. It's very steep and there is no trail. It's covered in trees, but this thing just moved up the hill, no problem. And it was gone. And it's the same exact area that this Bigfoot, crazy Bigfoot encounter happened. And I personally have experienced similar things that he experienced that night when we were out there, our last night, like Wes talks about when he was sitting in the car that he heard a growl, but also felt the growl. It was like it was in the car with him. I don't know if it, it might've been in the car with him and he just, it, it's just, it isn't understandable because we're thinking physical. So we're getting back on our RV and, and we're, we, we took our RV almost up to the location. I mean, it was probably, I would say, 500 feet away from the location itself. And it's the last night there. We're getting back in the RV. Cameraman gets, and this is why we need a second cameraman. Uh, the, the cameraman gets back in the RV. Everybody's getting on. And the reason why he's back on the RV, just so people understand, is that he's trying to film us getting back on the RV. Um, me and Joel are the last ones to get on. And we hear a deep, very deep growl. And it sounded like it was just over our shoulder. And we look, turn around and look, nothing. We look behind the RV, nothing. But that's exactly what Wes describes happening in that area. Wes saw the light in that area. We didn't see that light in the area, but we did, to connecting more dots to what you brought up. And I think it was a bug, okay? In my gut, I think it's a bug. But there's some members of my team that are not convinced it was a bug. 
we we might have caught a fay on camera. It was <gasps> it was it was a it was a it was a night vision camera, and so it's hard to tell what you're seeing. But I have to look back at the video to see what my reaction was because it, in, in my mind's eye, I get confused between the screen reality and my reality of what I was experiencing. Wow. But I feel like I, we didn't see it unless it was on the camera. But what, anyways, we catch it on camera. It flies up to our camera, flies off screen, and then comes back and goes right back to where it came from into the woods. And it appears when it comes out of the woods. And then, it, but it, it's it's wings and legs. And at first, you're like, is that what I think it is? And I'm looking at it, and I'm like. I'm going to go with bug because unless I know otherwise, but there are people on my team who really believe it was a fae and the jury's still out. And so I don't, I don't know if it's going to be in the film or not. Um, but if it's in the film, it's in the film. But anyways, I, I bring that up because again, we got specific location with a lot of weird going on. And these, these lights might be a vehicle mm. on, on that. Yeah, so I, I I I love that, and hopefully it is because a lot of times people will get these things and they don't include it. I know whenever I did, you know, the the, the one on uh, small town monsters, that was not the reason that the show was out there filming. But I think they should have said, okay, we're not going to look for Bigfoot at this point. We're going to focus on this anomaly. But you know, people have agendas and everything like that, and it still turned out to be a good series. But I'm going to put this out to you and your listeners as well too. In um, places where I've investigated that have a lot of Bigfoot encounters and a lot of UFO encounters, here in the Chestnut Ridge, we it, it goes to a place called Fayette County in West Virginia, where there's uh, the uh, Newtown Gorge or the uh, yeah the the New River Gorge. That's also uh, a Fayette County there as well too. And all these places around the country where very abnormal and uh, you know uh, uh, strange things go, woo things happen, often have the word uh, Fayette attached to them. And that actually is a French word that means little fairy. So is it possible that when people went into these areas, they named it Fayette as a warning to stay away rather than as a nice little name? So it's almost like here be dragon. So that's one of the things I'm looking at as well, too, because names mean something, right? So is it possible that whenever people went into these areas a couple hundred years ago, they named it Fayette because they were getting the same experiences? Ah. Uh. I love this conversation. Uh, th that's that's yeah. really interesting. Um, I, I mean, obviously, I know Fayette County, and, and and there's so much weird stuff going on there. In fact, I think I have a, an interview with a lady named Melissa Missy, something like that. I can't remember. It's years ago uh, where she moved back into her mom's house and the activity that goes on in her mom's house every night, repeatable. Um, th these things coming up to the house. Uh, these creatures, but I, I don't remember the details of the story. I should reach out to her again. Um, I don't remember the details of the story exactly, but I remember her reaching out to me before I was podcasting. And when I was just running my Facebook group, I had a Pennsylvania Sasquatch research group. And um, she told me this woo-woo weird stuff about Bigfoot. And I was like, Bigfoot's not like that. And uh, I was like, this lady's crazy. And then uh, a few years later, she emails. And I don't think she realized that she had already talked to me through that group. I don't think she remembered that. And I, I, I remember her. And I was like, I feel like I remember these stories being crazier. And I'm like, I think I've changed. <laughs> but she talks about, she talks about these lights coming up to the 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 door and this woo woo stuff with the Bigfoot and I was like, yeah, that makes perfect sense. And makes perfect sense. That's right. back in the day yeah. I was like, no way. That's right. Hey, look, I I'm so flattered that you asked me on the show and I know that you're a busy man. I don't want to seem like, oh, you want to have me on again, but I would love to talk to you just to show about nothing but earth lights or nothing about fairies because I have a book out called on fairies, which I, I it is an exhaustive 80,000 word piece of, of literature that I put out there. They really try to connect wow. the dots all around the world. And I have another book out called earth lights and, and intellectual inquiry it has not been, the, it's still at the publisher has not been out yet, but I would, these things are my passion right now. 
And after going out in the woods looking for footprints and looking at all this kind of stuff, this fascinates me far more because I think that if we are going to get to the crux of what's going on, for getting to the root of what's going on, this is where the answers lie. Or if not the answer is at least not, there's always going to be question marks at the end of the day, my friend, but at least we're getting a little bit closer to what truth is out there. Absolutely. And we'll definitely, we definitely will have you back on to talk about that. And I'm sure other things. So the way this conversation went, we jumped back and forth from, we went from uh, Pennsylvania to Egypt and back. <laughs> so, That's right. That's right. Uh, yeah. yeah. So let me just bring this up real quick. Cause I know you wrote, sure. you mentioned about, you wrote a book about, um, about witches. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I think that that is something that sh like witches should be looked at as well. And I don't know how you feel about the idea of modern witches and where you feel, what you think on all that stuff. But um, I know witches, you know, it's, it's part of the perks of the job. So right, uh, right, right, right. I, I talk to witches sometimes and uh, I actually am in communication with a witch who uh, claims to have open portals, or I should say, she tells me she closes portals, but I think she opens them too. Uh, uh -huh. And, and uh, I have a friend who told me that he was talking with a witch and she was in a school of mystery learning how to do witchcraft and they, they were learning how to open portals. And mm -hmm. she said, they opened a portal and an upright walking dog came through. Wow. What say you oh, to that? Wow. You know? <laughs> Wow, that that is some scary stuff. Hey, and you know what? Um, you know, in the Middle Ages, uh, Satan was often represented as a wolf. You know, the idea of this predatory animal. Um, and I think so. You and I've been in the field long enough to know that there are people out there that can do strange things, right? Whatever the reason, you know, which people are able to manipulate the world around them for whatever reason or by whatever means. And I've often said there's there are the idea of portals, and I think some of them are um, natural, and some of them are through intentions. And the ones that are through intentions are the ones that are most scary to me because you have no idea what the intentions are that opened up that portal, right? Because it's kind of like just giving it, throwing a key out there, and your hope that the stranger that finds that key is going to be a good natured person that opens up that door. But anything can open up that door. And I think a lot of places that are called haunted or, you know, even possessed or, you know, infiltrated by these kind of creatures may indeed have been a portal that somebody opened. And they simply have no idea on how to close. Yeah. I mean, so haunted locations, uh, but even like you said, possessed, that goes back mm -hmm. to the mind portal. Did you not close the portal door and something came Absolutely. through? Uh, and and so it, it's just, there's, there's a lot. Uh, of interesting things. And even with the the lights that we were talking about, and I was saying how it could be a vehicle. When I was saying, I, I didn't use the proper, like, when I'm saying vehicle, I'm saying, like, it, maybe that is a portal in itself, the, the vehicle, right. you know? And so, um, it, it's just, there's there's so much to consider and look through and, and just... And that's what I, that's why I like doing this show. The way I've built the show is I just think out loud. There's a lot of times that I have ideas on the show that I share publicly that I just came to me at that moment. And uh, and really, this show has been such a blessing for me because it allows me to uh, brainstorm in the moment, and then I get to record those brainstorms. And uh, and that's the way I do things. And so, uh, Ron, I, I, this this conversation went way better than I even could have imagined. And so. Uh, I am very much looking forward to having you back on uh, plenty of times and we're going to do this again for sure. I would be flattered. And if you ever get up to my neck of the woods, let's go out and look and see if we can get uh, into some of these fairy lights. Absolutely. And your neck of the woods is again, remind me. Um, I'm in Westmoreland County. So I'm right outside of Pittsburgh. Gotcha. Oh, for some reason I was thinking you were in Massachusetts. Why was I thinking? No, no, no. I'm in, I'm right here. Western Pennsylvania. I felt like you, you started there and then you, and I, I was like, and he moved away. So you're no. still in Western PA. Still here. Wow. Okay. Yeah. Listen, I'll tell you what. I I hardly come to Pennsylvania now, uh, but I will be going into the Virginias, West Virginia, doing some some funky stuff. Uh, if I ever get up there, though, we we need I, I need a, a personal tour of the weird stuff in the area. You'll get that, my friend. I assure you. Awesome, man. Well, uh, before we get out of here, let people know where they can get your content and where they can find you again. 
All right. So, yeah. So um, visit me on, uh, uh, you know, social media, Ronald Murphy, uh, you know, friend me, whatever the case may be. Uh, you can go to my author page, Ronald L. Murphy Jr. on Facebook as well, too. And Amazon, you can get my books on Amazon. And if you're out and about the last weekend of this month, I will be at the Kexburg Festival well, along with Stan Gordon there. So I'll be there at the end of the month. And of course, come, uh, come, uh, what is it? The end of August, right? Beginning of September, we will be at the Dogman uh, Conference number two uh, outside of Dallas, Texas. Hopefully you're going to be there too, right? No, I'm not going to be there. Oh, oh my goodness. It's all right though. I, I, I actually um, swore off traveling outside of Tennessee for the rest of the year, at least overnight. Okay. Uh, yeah. I'll make one exception and that's to hunt down a treasure connected to ancient ruins. That one I might do, but <laughs> nice, nice, nice. No. I've just done yeah. so much traveling out of state. I just wanted to stay close to home. Uh, well, if anybody here in Western Pennsylvania, you're traveling into Gettysburg, uh, not uh, this Friday, but next Friday, I'll be in Gettysburg for three days. And on Saturday, I'll be giving a talk about um, vampires. Oh my gosh. We're going to talk about vampires again. We're going to do yeah. vampires. We're going to do your witches. We're going to do the lights. We're going to talk about whatever. It's going to be fun. I can't wait to talk to you again. I can't. My, it's been it's been a pleasure, and it's been so long to get together. It was like pounding that bottle of ketchup, and whenever it finally comes out, it's the best taste of ketchup in the world. I, I agree. <laughs> On that note, that's the show, everybody. <laughs> <laughs>well that's the show everybody I really hope you enjoyed it if you did enjoy it share the show with your friends I don't care where or how you share the show just share the show if you enjoyed it that's the best thing you can do to help the show grow share the show and don't forget The Shape of Shadows that is the film we're coming out with on August 19th 2023 at 8pm Eastern Standard Time exclusively premiering on theshapeofshadows.com that is also where you can get your VIP or VIP plus tickets The Shape of Shadows. Dot com. That's the name of the film, and we're going to be going live with the premiere on August 19th, 2023. I hope you can be there, and until next week, friends, stay safe, take care, and remember, the truth will set you free, but first, it'll piss you off. Bye.